All right, it is Bitcoin L2 season. And so today we are going to be taking a closer look at ARC, which was announced just about a year ago in its initial proposal. And we now have the launch of ARC Labs, which is a company that is going to be dedicated to building out applications for the ARC protocol. And as we will discuss, ARC offers quite an interesting set of trade-offs when it comes to Bitcoin payments. Is it the future? Today we discuss. Let's jump in. This video is made possible by Bitcoin trading cards and I am pumped to have them as the first sponsor on my channel. I met Aladdin and the team back at Pacific Bitcoin 2022, and I'm not gonna lie, at the time I thought, okay, cool, a quirky little Bitcoin project, but little could I have imagined at the time how this project would capture imaginations. I've personally used these to orange pill people that I care about in my life. The art is stunning and features Bitcoin artists all around the world. You get high quality Bitcoin education on topics like economics and freedom as part of that which makes this, as you can imagine, a really special project for me. And I'm not gonna lie, it makes you want to collect these. The community behind this is also truly insane. And I think they have a real shot at bringing Bitcoin to the mainstream. So if you're curious to check them out, head over to btc-tc.com where you can find the different series they've launched. And hey, if you do end up snagging some cards, you'll also get some Bitcoin rewards back on your purchase, powered by Jolts. Here's to ripping packs and stacking sats. Okay, so those of you who have been watching some of my latest videos can probably start to see a theme. I did a video on eCash, specifically the Cashew implementation of this just a couple weeks back. And I went into similar detail as to what we will go through today with ARC. The really big picture here is, as I have said a number of times on this channel, there is a big question around how we scale Bitcoin payments, right? And this has been a question for years and years and years. And in the very early days of Lightning, I think a lot of people thought, well, this is it. Like, this is the answer. This is the silver bullet for all of our scaling woes. And this is going to allow me, the end user, to seamlessly and easily pay for that cup of coffee. And while Lightning is great, and as we will discuss, will play an integral role, even with all of these other L2s or L3s, whatever we want to call them, with rising on-chain fees that we've seen over the last year, it's becoming increasingly clear to me that perhaps Lightning is not the end-all be-all for that last end user. Non-custodial, important to caveat that, because custodial Lightning is beautiful. It's so easy. But again, do we really want a world in which vast majority of people are using Lightning in a custodial fashion? I would think not. And so again, check out some of my prior videos for some of those barriers when it comes to non-custodial usage of Lightning, right? You need existing inbound liquidity to receive any payments. So you need someone else to be able to open a channel with you. With the rise of LSPs or Lightning service providers, that has made a huge help uh, and we have largely solved that UX challenge, but there's still some other challenges, right? Offline payments, things like that. And so thematically what we are talking about when we talk about scaling Bitcoin is really scaling UTXO ownership, UTXOs or unspent transaction outputs, the sort of fundamental unit of the Bitcoin blockchain. Check out some of my intro playlist where I cover some of those more basic concepts. That is what we're trying to do here. How do I share this UTXO that I have? And if you think about it, Lightning is one way to do that. Where I open a payment channel with you with this particular on-chain UTXO, and now we can utilize that UTXO a lot more efficiently. We can send value back and forth as many times as we want. You can route value you know, to others on the network with others whom you're connected with. But if a Lightning Channel is essentially allowing me to share this UTXO between only two parties, how do I share that UTXO with many more parties is I think the conceptual question that a lot of these solutions are looking to address. And as we discussed in the eCash video, the answer there is, frankly, pretty simple. Make no mistake, eCash is a custodial solution. So you are basically depositing Bitcoin, whether on-chain or via Lightning, to a mint. And then the mint is in turn issuing the eCash. And again, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of 
positive UX benefits to eCash. It makes it super easy for the end user to receive payments, send payments. It solves a lot of those UX challenges that we see with non-custodial lightning usage. However, it has this massive trade-off in terms of you having to trust the Mint. Whereas what gets me really excited about Arc is while it uses design elements of eCash, it is not custodial. You have ASPs, which we will discuss, ARC service providers that are trustless servers in which you, the user, can always unilaterally exit, meaning you can permissionlessly withdraw from this system, similar to how you can do on the Lightning Network. And that really is the gold standard when we talk about layer twos. Do you have this ability to unilaterally exit or not? And so ARC in that regard is very exciting. And so the history here, as we discussed, this was proposed back in May of 2023. You now have uh, the launch of Arc Labs as discussed, as well as a working implementation of Arc that you can find on GitHub. All of this is open source. Uh, Arc Labs appears to have been backed by a grant from Vulpem Ventures. And so let's now talk a little bit about how this works. So the conceptual overview starts off looking awfully similar to eCash. Alice is depositing Bitcoin with an on-chain transaction to what is called a boarding address. So the boarding transaction is the process by which Alice deposits her UTXO and receives a VTXO or virtual transaction output because all of this is happening off chain. And so Alice can now send that VTXO, send that value to others. And those others importantly, don't need to have inbound liquidity such as what they would need on the Lightning Network to receive value, again, non-custodially. All they would need is a wallet. And so that's a huge step up in terms of onboarding, at least. And so that's the basic structure. You have these ASPs or ARC service providers. These are trustless servers. And then you have the users who are running wallets and light clients, you know, in their phones and what have you. Now, there is some nuance to this, as we can see. So step one in the onboarding, Alice sends that on-chain UTXO to an ARC boarding address. And then specifically for Alice, she actually does have to be online at least once every four weeks to preserve that value. Otherwise, the ASP can actually claim that after a period of four weeks. This is to help manage sort of stale liquidity. And then in addition, you can see some fancy stuff that happens when Alice is doing that because what she needs to also account for is the different withdrawal scenarios. So again, after four weeks, if Alice doesn't interact, the ASP gets to claim that or she gets to claim it back to herself, you know, or other scenarios even as well. And so actually this is why covenants or covenant-like functionality is important. And as far as I'm aware, the first actual implementation of this and the first wallets that you will see are going to be on Liquid, the sidechain to Bitcoin, where you already have what are called introspection codes via the elements engine, meaning you basically already have covenants functionality on the liquid sidechain. And what you're doing there is you're encumbering these UTXOs with spending conditions that will happen in the future. So first version of all of this appears to be set to go on liquid. However, they also have published a covenantless version of Arc, which as far as I can see, simulates covenant behavior with pre-signing, but uh, at the cost of increased bandwidth storage, interactivity for boarding. But suffice it to say, you have this onboarding process and you have this covenant-like functionality that is essentially paving the way for these different withdrawal scenarios at a later point in time. And again, why is all of that complexity needed? It is needed to ensure that user's ability to unilaterally exit the system, which we will discuss in a moment. So now that the onboarding has taken place and Alice has this VTXO, she can send that to Bob. And again, the nice part here is all Bob needs is a wallet. Like he doesn't need inbound liquidity. He doesn't need existing Bitcoin to create a payments channel or any of that stuff. All of that is getting offloaded to the ARC service provider. And so Alice basically tells the ASP to send that VTXO or send a you know, portion of it, whatever, to Bob. So periodically what's happening is that the ASP is conducting these rounds of transactions, meaning that periodically they're actually settling to Bitcoin in order to update the different withdrawal paths, depending on how these v VTXOs are being sent and dispersed among other users that are connected to that ASP. 
So again, a lot of the complexity here is all about ensuring that users can accurately and permissionlessly withdraw the value that they are entitled to from this system. Now, Alice sent this value to Bob, who is also connected to the same ASP, but let's say that she wants to send it to Carol, who is in another ASP. Well, guess what is used there? The Lightning Network. So the Lightning Network, as similar to eCash in terms of settling payments between different mints, in the case of eCash, is also being used to settle payments in between ASPs. And I think this further solidifies this kind of new emerging understanding of where Lightning really shines, it is as this interoperable settlement layer between all these other different kind of L2s and L3s and different things like that. So Lightning is still essential here. Okay, and so that behavior allows that original UTXO to be shared much more widely to many more users. And then the final step is, of course, leaving the ARC, right? And so there's cooperative exits, as we can see. Alice tells the ASP she wants to uh, trade her VTXO for a UTXO. Again, there's some uh, additional complexity that ensures protection against double spends, that ensures that there is integrity in the different withdrawal scenarios. Um, and or there's a non-cooperative exit as well. If the ASP is unresponsive or goes offline, Alice can still unilaterally exit by revealing the branch of the pool transaction that locks her funds. So there's all these connector outputs that are being used here. And so again, this is why those rounds that the ASP is doing is so essential. So, okay. Let's talk about some of the trade-offs though. What is the downside or what are the trade-offs because there always are to making this experience a lot easier for the end user. What are the trade-offs? And so as you might rightly intuit, if you're removing the burden from the end user, that means you're placing additional burden on the ASP. You can't just sort of do away. So as far as I can see, you're essentially just removing burden from the end user and placing it on the ASP. And that may indeed be the right trade-off in the right direction. But then we have to ask ourselves, well, what are the implications of that? Like are ASPs going to even be properly incentivized to have to take on this massive burden? How are they compensated? They're compensated through uh, transaction fees. So for sending value within that ASP. And so depending on how some of these economics shake out, like is it the case that the transaction fees would have to be, you know, a lot higher than one would get on the Lightning Network just to kind of properly compensate this additional burden for the ASPs to manage all of this liquidity. It also raises potential questions around centralization. Now, these servers are trustless and they can't steal user funds due to atomicity or atomicness of some of what's happening under the hood there. But I don't know, like there's probably some implication that you know we're not yet thinking about. At the very least, the implication could be from even a regulatory standpoint, if there's only a few major ASPs given the high burden of running it, right? These things I, I imagine are gonna just have to be bigger and bulkier than even LSPs or lightning service providers. And so does that create potential regulatory risk if regulators could come after only a couple different kind of enforcement points versus which could be thousands of mints in the case of eCash, although again, there's that worst, uh, you know, custodial trade-off for users, or in the case of Lightning, you know, there could be a lot more LSPs. Again, it remains to be seen, but that is a hypothesis for one of the trade-offs we may see. It does still require on-chain transactions to board the ARC, to bring a UTXO and lift it uh, onto the ARC. So again, there's still a reliance on chain in order to do that. From that point on, the VTXO can be shared much more widely than a UTXO locked in a two of two payment channel. And then similarly to exit the ARC, a user would need enough value to pay for at least an on-chain transaction. So if fees truly get high enough in the future, are certain users sort of locked into ARC and can't actually exit in any case, even though they could if they had enough funds? There's the covenants versus non-covenants, right? So the covenant-less version requiring some of those increased bandwidth and storage considerations. Again, does that play into the potential centralization piece for ASPs that we discussed earlier? Again, Lots of hypotheticals here, but those are probably some of the trade-offs that we could imagine. But nonetheless, very interesting stuff. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. What do you think? Let me know in the comments down below. 
Are you bullish on ARK? Are you bearish on ARK? I personally think it is a really, really interesting design that for me at least improves significantly on uh, just Xiaomi and eCash, given that unilateral exit uh, potential. As we saw, Lightning goes hand in hand with these additional layers to Bitcoin by settling value in between whether it's ASPs, whether it's different mints, whether it's different federations, liquid to you know other layers, all of that and more. And so what's next? It sounds like there is a main wallet coming that will be initially on liquid as we discussed. You can technically go to this uh, arc.volpum.com. I think they were only sharing this with some of the attendees at a recent uh, lightning conference. But yeah, you can create a, a little wallet and you can receive some, some value. So in any case, be sure you're su subscribed. I wanna do this video to form a foundation of understanding of this thing. And then in future videos, we'll definitely go through uh, tutorials on some of the wallets that come out. But curious to hear your thoughts, let me know in the comments down below. But I hope you found this valuable and insightful. If you did, you already know what to do. Give this video a like, use the share feature underneath this video that really does help get this to a broader audience. And if you were so enamored with this content, you wanna to donate to a pleb, which really does help me continue to make these videos, you can do so in a number of ways. You can use the YouTube super thanks feature built directly into YouTube, or you can zip some sats my way on the Lightning Network to my Lightning address, me at www.enmajor.xyz or ragermajor at getlb.com. And lastly, for those of you that wanna get in touch with me one-on-one, -on -one, I'm now working with a number of clients on all sorts of topics, taking self-custody, running a node, uh, privacy best practices, recovering you know seed phrases and more. You can reach out to me at vida.io slash ianmajor. But for now, we'll go ahead and leave this here. As a reminder, every sack counts. And until next time, my friends, I'll see you then.